chef doesn't like it if we if we don't break at noon. But we have a window, and I thought uh, what I might do in the context that Mark has set up, uh, open-minded, wonderful, dialectical, centrist, uh, non-judgmental, pure, fair attention <laughs> in the context, I thought perhaps I would share with you the Four Noble Truths. Uh, since we're sort of associating all this with, and we're trying to deal with anxiety, depression, and addiction. And um, so, Buddha's therapy, let's call it. Let's call it that. And how many of you could recite what are the Four Noble Truths just right off the bat? How many? Can you hold up your hand. What? <laughs> That's the right choice, I think. <laughs> okay, but first, you have to set the context. So Shakyamuni Buddha, after a lot of struggles, uh, attained some sort of, supposedly, attained uh, realization of the nature of reality right down to past the subatomic particles, you know, right to the, the void, you, let's call it, uh, which he discovered was not a black hole. It was, uh, if anything, a pulsar, you know, beyond the black holes. And um, he was so grouped out, and he's, he was very happy, he said, profound, peaceful, uncomplicated, luminous, and uncreated, like an elixir of immortality, of deathlessness, is this, is this reality I have found, I have experienced. Whoever I show it to, teach it to, they probably won't understand. I think I'll just hang out here in the, in the garden, the jungle garden, and uh, without speaking, and stay here happily alone. Uh, but that was uh, the second part. He then, after a while, spent apparently something like uh, seven weeks, a couple months, um, relaxing on his own, enjoying this insight. Although from my own point of view, he taught the Flower Ornament Sutra during that time in other planes. He wasn't actually just, well, you know, everything he did subsequent to that apparently was relaxing. <laughs> Non-judgmental, uh, just realizing reality, realizing the nature of reality by being reality to the full, let's say, which is infinite, to the infinite full. So then he thought about who he would share, he was encouraged, actually had a conversation with God, actually. Uh, Brahma, whose name was Brahma in India, who was considered the creator god by some people in India, since Indians were always very diverse, and, and, um, but a very strong majority considered Brahma to be the creator. And he had this conversation with God, who was very delighted to have someone who understood the nature of reality, which he said he did not himself quite understand. But he appealed to him, he said, oh no, don't sit there and not to tell people what you have discovered, or of course you can't really tell them, because everyone has to experience it for themselves, and words will not suffice to explain it. God actually was that enlightened already. But he said, one thing that I'm upset about is that people think I'm omnipotent, and that I created everything. And, you know, it's a little bit my fault, because when, the, when, the, when I first came into this round of the universe, which was not the first one, when I first came to it, I seemed to be the first person here all by myself at first. And I just showed up in this new universe, and you know, I was in some very comfortable plane there, but there was nobody else around, and I didn't quite know what was happening. And then a whole bunch of other gods, you know, godlings, like angels or godlings, whatever you want to call them, suddenly showed up, because those in the heavenly plane, they don't need a womb, it's not a long thing like that, they just immediately, they're called, born by apparition. And when they showed up and they saw me there, preceding them, they said, Dada! Mm. And at first I said, I'm not your Dada. I, I want to, let's figure it out, what's going on, let's work together to figure this out here. And then they got all freaked out looking. So I said, okay, okay, I'm Dada, everything is fine. Everything is cold, don't worry. And then they seemed so at ease, etc. So, so then that's sort of, I've been letting it sort of spread by rumor throughout the galaxy, 
that I do know what's going on and I did create it and I am omniscient and so on. But then, human beings and other beings that suffer get mad and they think, well, he's omnipotent, how come they blame me? And I'm, I'm very loving and friendly, you know. I'm Brahma, I'm God, you know, I'm very friendly. And I'm the top God, and the other gods kind of like defer to me. But I'm not omnipotent. And I didn't create their suffering. And uh, I'd like you to inform them of that fact. <laughs> that would be good. I like it when they worship me when they're on top of the world. But when they have suffered badly and get really pissed off with God, me, I don't like the vibe. <laughs> so, you know, my, my poll numbers deteriorate. <laughs> so please tell them that we're all in it together. And yeah, I'm, in, I'm not been created perfectly without suffering, and they also have not arranged things perfectly without suffering. So please, uh, uh, you know, tell them. And then during that time, apparently, he had that conversation, that 49 days. So then he decided he would tell the human being. So then he went, he, he, he used his sort of what they call divine eye and divine ear, like ability to know things remotely uh, by sort of in the collective cosmic mind or something to know what was going on. And he realized that his two yoga teachers that he had stopped with on his way to his own solitary six years of extreme self-mortifying asceticism, uh, he self-punishment, attempt to withdraw from the world. Uh, he, those two yoga teachers who had taught him certain samadhis, they had passed away, he realized. So he, because first he wanted to go and form them, because they were very deep people, but not quite there, you know, and he had not stayed with them. And, um, uh, but they had passed away. So then he remembered that he had been with these five other self-mortifying uh, ascetics who were in really bad shape. And he knew where they were, in, in near Benares, in a place called Deer Park. So he walked from Bodh Gaya to there, supposedly, in a day or two. And, um, and then he came up to see them, these five guys. And um, when they saw him, they said, oh, here comes that Turkey Gautama, Siddhartha. And he gave up our rigid regime of self-punishment. And look at him, he looks well fed, he looks relaxed, he looks happy. <laughs> And he's glowing, and uh, he must have been eating, I don't know what, you know, like taking vitamins. Forget about this guy. Don't, don't even get up when he comes nearby. But when he did, but his field, as he came close, was such they felt sort of just lifted. And they were really nice. And then they said to him, Oh, uh, okay, hello, friend Siddhartha. Hi, pal, kind of thing like that. They said, Don't call me pal. He said, I'm not your pal. I'm a Buddha now. I'm Shakyamuni. Actually, he was their best friend, but he didn't want them thinking he was just like he had been. And then he looked at them, and these were five guys who were really funky. <laughs> they hadn't had a square in six years. They hadn't had a bath. They hadn't cut their toenails or fingernails. They hadn't cut their hair. They were really like... And he looked at them and said, this is suffering. <laughs> It didn't really take a Buddha or he'd be the genius you know, looking, at looking at them. He didn't qualify the this, what he meant by the this. He later he did. So people will only have understood from that over the years that Buddha was a kind of killjoy, you know, horrible ascetic, and this is suffering means everything is suffering. And the world is no good at all. And it's horrible and all this. And uh, the Pope Benedict was very upset about it. It's all so depressing. How can anybody be a Buddhist? And when, when he said it's all suffering, and he should have been really jolly and happy like we are in the Vatican. <laughs> and and uh, they were very upset about it. So people have, generally, even in Asia, the Hindus, some of them were very upset about it. Chinese Confucian people were upset about it. And um, a lot of people were upset about it. This misunderstanding. But he qualified that later to say that the unenlightened life will be frustrating. And if you think about it, his near contemporary Socrates, 
was reported to have said, the unexamined life, unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. And Buddha never said it wasn't worth living. He just said, it will be frustrating, it will be suffering. The unenlightened life, which is like that, similar to the unexamined life, it'll be similar to that. But his, of course, so then he taught what was called the Four Noble Truths. And this is, you know, this is a therapeutic model, 100%. It's a total therapeutic model. And uh, first noble truth, and it's called noble truth. The reason he called them noble is he took the word that at that time in India was a class term for the upper class, higher class, and he redefined it, which of course they didn't realize right away, but he redefined it to be a cognitive term. And noble meant someone who is properly shrunk. Absolutely. <laughs> meaning they are not completely trapped in their own world of self-enclosure, but they have become at least enlightened enough, and there are, there are of course, you know, huge uh, spectrum of, of degrees, but somewhat enlightened enough to realize that others are equally as alive and important than themselves, and indeed other, they're more of the others, and so actually they have a sense of empathy for those others, by understanding the nature of the self, they have then become aware of the others in a sort of empathic way, and therefore are noble. They have like a noblesse oblige, they have care for them. They feel their feelings are of equal importance to their own, and perhaps because there's so many more of them, more important to their own. So they have become at least altruistic enough to be considered noble by this new definition of noble. So he called them noble truths because these things are true for someone who has achieved that greater degree of openness and sensitivity. And they're not true for the ordinary self-enclosed, self-defended, shut off, self, you know, self-centered, you know, uh, pathologically self-centered type of person, which is everyone, more or less, who has not gone through some kind of an opening process, and especially more males than females in his culture. And generally, I think since then, last few thousand years, we're still stuck there, at some point. In fact, I would definitely say. And um, so, so, there, so that's what he called the noble truths. So the first one is the symptoms of the unenlightened life, which is the self-centered, both metaphysically self-centered by thinking that the self is the most important and greatest reality and is a fixed and almost an, even an absolute almost sort of thing. Never change my real identity. You know? And uh, um, that the unenlightened life stuck that way will be frustrating because there will be the suffering that the happiness, the, the momentary relief and happiness, what, what people think of as mundane happiness, temporary relief from anxiety, depression, and addiction, <laughs> that moment, those moments of momentary relief will not last. 